cogent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Masters, and today on the show, we have Lo- Luann Nagara. She actually has a real business. We were talking about this right before. It's called Window Works. It's in New Jersey. She's also been called a window treatment authority, which I thought was amazing. She has a podcast. It's called the Well-Designed Business Podcast. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, Jamie, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. This is really actually just a tiny bit of a thrill for me. You know, you're a a leader in our industry here. So I'm very excited to finally meet you um, virtually in person. (laughs) I'm so excited because I was like, yes, I have one woman entrepreneur today (laughs) on my schedule. I I try. I so try. And the fact that you have an insane business when we were just chatting before, you're like, I've been in business 35 years. I'm like, I'm so excited to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about the beginning? beginning parts and diving into starting this business and tell everybody what it is also. <laughs> okay. So uh, Window Works is a custom window treatment and awning retailer. And as you said, we're in Livingston, New Jersey, and I'm actually co-owners with my husband and our cousin, Bill. And, um, you know, we started it together back in the early eighties and it started originally Window Works was actually a franchise and, uh, it was a franchise that was born in Florida, South Florida. And when we purchased our, started our franchise, it, we were the 11th franchise in the system. And by the time the franchise was sold, one time was a happy sale, good for all of the, uh, franchisees. The second sale was basically a corporate raider and that busted up the franchise. Um, but by the time it sold, there were over a hundred units across the country. Wow. So, um, and so that was uh, fun. And we, my husband was actually the franchisor for the state of New Jersey. So we had t- sort of two roles. We ran our own business, but then he also, um, recruited and sold to other people to have a franchise. And then our team trained them. Do you like the franchise model? People go back and forth. And one of my clients is a franchise lawyer. And it's like, do we start our own? Do we get a franchise? Tell me what you thought about that process at the beginning. Well, I, from the from the standpoint of our experience, the one thing that it did do was that it really, because of franchise, really, what is it? Is it's a it's a cookie cut system for running a business, right? And so, from that standpoint, it really teaches you the value of having a system for running your business. So I know for a fact that my husband would have had the system anyway. This franchise that we had together was his uh, third, second business. And he was a systems guy to begin with. But it, I don't know that I could have, I don't know that any of the three of us could have lived with being a franchisee for our entire business life because you do have a lot of your wings are clipped because do it this way, don't do it that way. But um, looking back as young people, the value of this is how you write an order. This is how you execute this. That is one thing now that we are constantly trying to teach people in business behind us that you've got to have that foundation of your systems so that you can start to really scale up and duplicate yourself and all of the things that come with a successful business. Yeah, it helps you hit the ground running a little bit faster, but it also costs quite a bit too. So you're paying money instead of the time that it would take you in order to do that. But of course, if you don't have the experience, it's way harder to figure it out on your own. So when did you guys not become a franchise then? It was probably around uh, 92. So maybe 10 years into it, the franchise disbanded. So the thing for us is that uh, we, because we were the first one in New Jersey and because, like I said, my husband's role was also to recruit and train and our, our, our business was the training ground for the other 26 franchises in New Jersey. Uh, I can't say that we always had the experience of almost being quote unquote, the franchisor. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because we were the, the, the hub here in Jersey and we were the training ground and the teachers and so forth like that. So we, at that point, we probably weren't deriving a whole lot of benefit from being a franchise, yep. but I don't mean that in a negative way. It wasn't like we were ever like, this is, this is crazy. There's no value here. There's, there's other, there were other tangible benefits of being a part of a buying group and being part of um, an opportunity to meet yearly at a conference with just your own people and have your own conversations about the things that were specific to your industry and those learning things. So 
it was always a positive experience until it, the day it wasn't. And that's when we got the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> See, I love hearing this. A lot of people don't talk about the pieces behind it because I've had people that um, have had franchises and then decided to do their own thing. And they, of course, non-compete. They have to wait for a while and all that stuff. But they're like, I can do it better and blah, 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 because they did feel like their wings were clipped. But I love that you actually found assets within all of oh. that, too. What, yeah. made, what made you not sort of go and franchise on your own afterwards? Well, I guess because we, that's a whole nother business. I mean, we were busy running the business of window treatments and awnings. And so that would have literally been a different business model. And one of the things that we're very strong on and have identified very clearly as a principle of being successful in business is knowing your core mission. And our core mission was to sell window treatments and awnings. That's at the very basis. It was to provide shade and light control and privacy at the window. And so to go and launch a franchise selling a, selling window treatment businesses wasn't part of our core mission. Did you ever get bored with your mission? Because no offense, it's window treatments. I know you're I the know. authority, but let me just, <laughs> let's ask that. I have to. Um, every fifth day? No. <laughs> <laughs> 35 um, years I, is a long time in yeah, window yeah. treatments. I mean, truthfully, Jamie, there is a, a long and a short answer to that. The short answer to that is, oh, oh, heck yeah. You know what I mean? And the long answer to that is that one of the places that I've actually come to in this trajectory of being in business this many years is that I've gone through the struggle and I don't, when I say I, it's we, it's definitely my husband, myself and my cousin, and it's our team. But we've been through the struggle to get a business off the ground. We've been through the struggle to weather our first recession, which was the craziest, scariest thing that we've ever done. And then, you know, you are up and you're running and you're kind of like all engines are firing. And then that's when it's like, wait, wait, this is it forever. Like, and then like I totally personally had a midlife crisis in our business. I, I, I completely, I was like, you are out of your mind if you think I am doing this for another 40 years. You're absolutely crazy. I'm bored out of my mind. I don't care if they get white or off white. I'm tired of deciding <laughs> if the, the rod should be at 93 inches off the ground or 93 and a half inches off the ground. Shoot me. You know what I mean? And my husband, you know, he very smartly looked at me and he said, you're looking at a staff of 20 people at this point and you are the number one driver of sales and it's not about you. You don't get to jump ship. You know what I mean? He goes, we have two kids in college. We have, you know, 20 employees and you don't get to jump ship. Get over yourself. Get back in the game. <laughs> and that worked. Well, it did because what I did was, I mean, this is funny that we're going down this whole road, but I do think it's sort of a, you know, empathy journey is what I did was I stepped out a little bit and did something just for me. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I had stepchildren in college and high school. I had a, a baby that was probably five years old. And what I did was I've always wanted to learn French. So I was like, well, then I'm learning French. And he's like, whatever. <laughs> okay, have fun with that. No. <laughs> and I have to do it during the day because I'm not going there at night and yada, yada, yada. And the thing was, Jamie, it was funny. It was because with just the distraction of really immersing myself into something that I was learning, like 10 years ago, that was, you know, 25 years ago. Now, 10 years ago, it was yoga. I was like, I have to learn yoga. <laughs> and so I just find that when it matters, in this case, it mattered. We had an entire staff and, and we had bills and I was the, you know, one of the most, you know, sales drive numbers. You do have to figure out ways to keep your head in the game. And so what would always happen is I would go out do some personal development and then all of a sudden things would happen. And all of a sudden I, I would be busier at work and, oh, I can't take French anymore and I can't get to yoga this week. And I would get revitalized. And the, the end of the story and the, this is the long answer and is that at this point, I look back at it much the way you would look back at a 30 plus year marriage. There's really intense moments. There's really hard moments. There's really joyous moments. Um, but it's it's worth the ride and, and it's worth the ride to, to ride it through and and be grateful for what you've created. 
I love all you gave me goosebumps too. So I love all of this because I, I think what sucks is with entrepreneurs, we we like change a lot and we love learning and growing. And so when you feel like you're stagnant, even if it's a, a good stagnant in your business, we're like, what's the next thing? Where do right. we go? Right? Oh, let me start right. seven more businesses. <laughs> and what what you're saying is you solve that same need, right? To get over the ebbs and flows um, with still learning and creating, but just in a different side of it. So I really, really appreciate you saying that because most entrepreneurs entrepreneurs just assume they have to sort of wipe away and throw away what they've done and then start something new or something like that. Right. Well, and that was, that goes back to sticking to your core mission. And, you know, it goes back to, you have to, that business has to keep riding. And so like, sometimes like I, I'll give you a perfect example. At one point I said, well, maybe we should start to do interior design too. We should do floor plans and decorating and stuff like that. And he's just looking at me like, no. And I'm like, well, maybe we should have furniture in the showroom. And he's just looking at me, no. And at one point, I did actually convince him to let me put a few pieces of furniture in the showroom and some accessories that people could walk in and cash and carry. Well, whether they were there one year or five years, not one item was ever sold because it isn't what we do. <laughs> and he was just indulging me. He was just like, all right, you crazy lady. You want to like, put some accessories? <laughs> And that's exactly it. Now, whereas if he was a hard and fast partner, mm -hmm. he probably would have just said no way. But because there's that part where he's my husband and he loves me and he's like, all right, I'll make her happy, put the stupid stuff in the showroom. But I now know and I understood looking back is like you said, if you're a little bored in your business, is it because it's running so well don't upset the apple cart and screw with that. Go get a hobby for an, a year or two until you get excited again. <laughs> I love this. I, I want to talk about you and having your husband as a business partner. I just did a whole thing um, in Thailand, uh, not just, but I uh, did a whole thing in Thailand about this because, and I've worked with tons of married couples or people and family businesses. Oh, right. <laughs> so do you have any tips uh, for people? Because what, what I loved about what you just said is you're like, so I finally convinced him to do this. And he finally indulged me. Right. And, and everybody's like nodding their head. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That makes total sense. Right. With marriage, right. with right. business, it's it's so interesting because it, it's just feels like it's so different. And yet it's still a relationship. So yeah. you tell me some tips or feedback or examples that you've had from weathering that storm of business and with uh, okay. with your marriage? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is I'm not going to like kid you and say, oh, don't go to bed um, angry at each other ever. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you're going to go to bed angry sometimes if you're creating an entire life with children and mortgages and a business. It's going to happen, okay? <laughs> we all feel better now. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like the straight talk, right? Um, but I would say as as much as, you know, the, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say in that is be, uh, be realistic in your expectations, right? Number one. Um, and I think anybody that tells you, hey, it's a cakewalk, crazy pants. Okay. But I will tell you that I would say, I'd say, I don't know if this is like childbirth or not. You know how it's like when you have childbirth and you're just like in the moment, it's like, oh my God. And then a day later, you're like, well, that wasn't that bad. So I don't know if this is like, I was about to say, I would say that 98% of the time it was awesome. And I'm like, what's this like childbirth where it really wasn't 98% of the time? I would be so interested. It, it is one of those things, right? The pain, when the pain is really, really great. Thank goodness. We can, I, we have video of me when I had my first baby going one baby like oh that we're having one and of course i have two right of course right so so yes that's a wonderful thing i feel like that's uh the best part of our evolution to forget that piece right so i want to know though think about it is it 98 percent, or are we yeah. going oh everything's sunshine and roses right now you know well I, I, you know what I would say, I, I will, and without kidding, truly, truly, I will say that we have a very great dynamic and it's, don't forget, it's our cousin too. So it's three family, family members. Yes. Okay. And um, we have a very great dy dynamic in that, you know, the ebook, right? The e-myth book with Gerber, right? Everybody mentions that. I love, yes, yes. I okay. Definitely know so that. here's the funny thing. Now I told you, we started our business in the early eighties and I only became aware of this book maybe a year and a half ago. And as I'm listening to this book on tape, I'm like, wait a minute. We are the e-myth. We are legitimately the e-myth. And so my husband now, these are Larry Gerber. I mean, Larry Gerber. These are uh, Michael Gerber's um, descriptions. He says you have the manager, 
who, you know, oversees the bookkeeping and the finances and the insurance and, you know, la la la. Then you have the technician and then you have the entrepreneur. And I happen to disagree with the moniker entrepreneur because they're all entrepreneur. But the entrepreneur is the visionary, the one who pushes the dreamer, um, who looks at the big business picture and work on the business as opposed to in it. Right. We are very truly by nature, those three individuals. Really? Wait, who's who? Who's what? So your husband's systems, right? Is right. So okay. he's the manager. Okay. He's the systems. He has an MBA in accounting. He's got, I mean, he has an accounting degree and an MBA in business. And he is the one that, you know, all things strategic with the business. Are we going to take a lease on? Are we going to buy a new truck? Are we going to hire a new employee? Are we going to, you know, can we handle it from a num number standpoint? And he's the one who oversees all of that. And then Billy is our lead installer. My, our cousin, he's the technician. He's the one who creates art at the window. He's, if I could do everything I could do, my husband could do everything he does. But if Billy doesn't put up an amazing window treatment, nobody's calling you again. And then I'm the person that's always like, like I remember when like the internet started and I was saying, we need a website. And they're like, what do we need a website for? I'm like, well, it's going to be a big thing. We need a website. And I'm like, we have to start doing email. They're like, why do we have to start doing email for? And then how about last year? We need a podcast. They're like, what's a podcast? I'm like, we just need one. It's the next thing. We have to do it. <laughs> That's amazing because you're always looking at the forefront. Go you. Yeah. Most people don't do that. Right. And so that ties back to how our marriage works within the partnership, because not that we don't ever fight to the death on something that we each really want. Right. But we have always from the very beginning respected and understood without Michael Gerber writing a book and telling us that we each have our what's the buzzword now our zone of genius right this is the where we all hear now right so but we we just instinctively understood that we each had certain areas of the business that we were better at than the other partner all of us are have our strengths and are good at a lot of things and when we would have a disagreement it was just understood that the partners whose domain that was has the final say. And so you could fight to the death. You could bring your case day after day. And I could walk through the door and say, I still don't want to, or he could still. But ultimately, when that, and we never said, you're in charge of this, you're in charge of this. We just organically respected each other's domain. And now it has become that. So it wasn't as though you had the org chart and you're like, I'm going to do these types of roles. It was like these, the strength sort of came and evolved from what you're yeah, doing. Yeah. And you just sort of looked at your, your other person there and you just said, you know, you're really good at that. And so why would I second guess you on that? And so I, I think now yourself as a business coach, and I talk to a lot of young entrepreneurs as well, is I say, have that conversation if you have partners, right? Definitely. We were very lucky that we all really have very, very different skill sets. If if we, it wouldn't have worked out for us organically if we both had, if we each two of three had the same skill That's set. That's what I was going to ask you though, because like, if you're married, you can't be like, oh, thank goodness my uh, husband is a this, right? You don't know what they are. So you, So what if it doesn't work? What if it's not that synergistic? Do you think people should get into business together? Well, then I, I don't know if they shouldn't. I mean, I think that they I think anybody who has a desire to and has a good product and has a good uh, foundation for what the idea and the concept and everything is, I think they should go for it. But I do think in that case, you do have to have very clear discovery sessions even if it's just the two of you at the kitchen table. You know, I understand that we're both really good at finances, but who is more, just one little bit more adept or who has that really great skill at finance plus can sort of project, you know, or is, how about the one that's better at finances and is more interested in keeping up with world events as they relate to mm -hmm. finances, right? You could both be good at numbers and one of you can't care what's happening in the trends and the recessions that might be coming or going. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to me, it's about facing it with eyes wide open and making agreements. Because look, we have skills that overlap. My husband is also an excellent salesperson. So it's not like, oh, I'm like this and he's like this. I mean, you know, we're sort of like this. And so, but there are just certain things that at the end of the day, you got to go, okay, that's your domain. You're better. You're even if you're just one inch better. 
<laughs> See, that's perfect though, that you're both really good salespeople because that's amazing for a business. And then for everything, it just worked out perfectly for you it guys. It did work out. <laughs> <laughs> Man, everyone's like, this is annoying. No. So, <laughs> so, so let's let's uh, break it down into a little more details too because I get this question and I feel like there's so many nuances. So I want your feedback or stories or whatever you've got on this because when do you put the line between when you talk about business and when you talk about personal? Like at the dinner table, are you allowed to bring up business stuff? Where Tell me more about how try this goes. Try not to. That's all I would <laughs> say is try not to. I mean, honestly, Jamie, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would say it's always open for discussion. I don't think that we've ever said, you know, we'll only talk about it during, you know, nine to nine and not after 9 p.m., you know. Um, but I think for us, we both really, we really love our business. We really love the people that work for us. We love each other. We love our partner. Um, we love our clients. Um, you know, um, we enjoy it. And I would say there has, it's, there have been moments where I, I know me particularly, where I have just said, I, I, I really just need a moment not to talk about this. And so, but I would say maybe I've said that five times in 30 plus years where I just went, I'm up to here. I have too much on my plate right now and I know that I can't accomplish it. And so right now I need to just pretend that it's not real. <laughs> I know that feeling. Yes. But it's the awareness and change the subject. <laughs> yes, seriously. I think everybody can identify with that. Like, and I'm done. Nope. I'm done. Done, done, done. And crucially, halfway into that wine, I'd be like, all right, now I can talk. <laughs> I, so that's the funny thing, it, like what you're bringing up over and over is these ebbs and flows, right? And so us really paying attention to the, the fact that there are ebbs and flows, both in marriages and in businesses and in days, right? Like, <laughs> and riding the wave. So what, how do you do that? Especially like, do you do a lot of self-care stuff? And I know we're, go we're talking about what we totally not said we were going to talk about, but I find this so interesting. Like, are you one of those type of people that work really, really hard during the day and like really try and give yourself the self-care that people need, right? Especially as a mom, it's really tough. <laughs> um, I would say I was much better at it when I was a mom with children in the house. Really? You were better oh, at it? Yeah. Don't yeah, tell yeah. me that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, because what I would do is I would multitask it. So then, in other words, when you have small children in the house, and maybe, you know, not younger than eight, because your kids are probably not at the age where they're at a lot of activities, but from eight until, you know, they drive, at least my kids, you know, was, you know, gymnastics and, you know, piano and yada, yada. And what I, and CCD, I mean, I literally, every single time she was at an activity, then I did an activity. So if, if I was, if it was a piano lesson, then I had to walk around the block as many times as it took for her to get out of piano. If it was a gymnastic session that was going to go an hour and 20 minutes, okay, I dropped you off, I go to the gym. Um, and that could be at three o'clock in the afternoon. You know what I mean? Because what would happen for me is I could sit at my desk for an hour and 15 minutes and know I could get up on time to pick her up. But I couldn't take a client facing appointment and know that I could get up and leave in that time frame. So it became, well, I know I can go to the gym and leave in that time frame. Let me do that. You know what I mean? And so, um, I mean, one time she was in high school and we had set up uh, she, my daughter, my youngest daughter was a uh, softball pitcher and she played at college and everything. And at one point she was involved in like strength training and agility training. And it was twice a week. And I said to, when I went to the place and I was interviewing which gym to take her to this, that, cause it's like high level training and all that stuff at that point. Right. And finally they knew it was between them and another place. And they were offering a Tai Chi class on the same nights, but it was only to kids. And I said, look, here's the deal. I'll put her in the training here if I can take the Tai Chi class the two nights a week at no charge. <laughs> Sold. You are a negotiator. <laughs> so now it's harder because now it's harder to stop for me because, you know, now like when I, you know, when I would be at my desk and the, the pile would be to here and she had to be picked up from basketball practice at six o'clock. 
you know, okay, you might show up at 10 after six and she's the only kid standing there with the coach under the street light. You know what I mean? But you don't show up at 730. Yes. And so now it's like, oh, there's a yoga class at six. Oh, at five to six at six. Oh, well, five after I guess I missed it. I'll work another three hours. I guess I'll go home at midnight tonight. So it's harder now. Jamie, Why actually. is that? Okay. So let's talk about that because I, I didn't quit my job until I got pregnant because it was a catalyst, right? I don't, and when the kids have to be picked up from school, you pick them up. And yet the weeks that I don't have the kiddos, I'm like, I'm just gonna a little, like we're so horrible at this for ourselves. How can we make it better? What has worked for you on that uh, side? Cause everybody well, knows it's hard, but I'm sure you, you yeah. solved a few of it. Well, what it is, is um, it what, for me, what it happened, I, I, look, I don't have a magic pill. I'm, I'm, I'm honest with you. You really Darn just have it. to make the That's decision. That's why I had yeah. you on. <laughs> <I> know, sorry. <laughs> False advertising. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really just, it, it's just like everything else. It comes down to a choice. And there are, just like we talked about ebbs and flows, there are weeks and months that I'm better at, that. it yoga's at six, I'm leaving, or I'm not taking any appointments till 9.30 because I'm going to go for a run in the morning and then I have to shower. I mean, I have to say my husband is so lucky because A, he's bald, and B, he's a guy. So he just puts his exercise in at 11 o'clock in the morning, goes, does a good 40-minute workout, takes a 10-minute shower, and he's back to work. And I'm like, I got to dry my hair. I got to do my makeup. I can't do it in the middle of the day. So, but it, it is, Jamie, it just, what I find for me is I'm mostly in balance and I don't really mean that the hours are balanced. That's just a term I, I use for my inner world, my brain inside. Um, and I do, I can be guilty of all work and not enough play. And what will happen though is there'll be a moment where my person, my body, my inner voice will just really start to be like, okay, crazy lady, like this, this can't continue, you know, you're yeah. go, no good to anybody. And I, but mostly what I notice is I will have a loss of patience for a task that really should have been no big deal. And then I'll go, oh, okay, when's the last time you went for a run? And I'll be like, yeah, it's a little too long. <laughs> okay, I love you saying this because I feel like, especially females, right? And I've been chatting with my uh, uh, guy clients on this and I'm like, all right, let's talk about feelings. This is going to be fun. And they're like, oh gosh, Jamie. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, logical. It's going to be law, I promise. But you said your your inner, inner knowing or inner voice or whatever that was. And what's funny is... <laughs> I've been working on this for a long time. Like, what do I actually want? What do, how does it show up? Because what you just said is, oh, the loss of patience. How did you start fine tuning and really paying attention to what was the actual issue instead of you just losing your patience more often? Well, because I just have it. And um, I, I, look, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it comes with age. It comes with years. I know that by nature, I'm a roll with the punches person. You know, like I don't get rattled, you know, it's like things happen every day. I tell my employees every day, if you think that you're not going to make a mistake today at work, just stay home. If you're waiting for me not to make a mistake, then don't look because so I know that each one of us in our team, somebody is going to have a mistake today. They're going to forget to do something. They're going to do something wrong. And those that does not rattle me. It's, it's it expected and roll with it and um, get up and go on. And so when a small little thing is like, I'm just like, I, I mean, I will crazy pants. I'll literally find myself scream out loud and I'll be like, okay, you're off your rocker. <laughs> Not out of person, but it's usually like I'm getting in the car and I, instead of making three trips, I have to carry everything in one trip because I'm so hurried, I'm so late and I've got 20 things to do and then everything drops. And instead of just being like, oh, I dropped everything, I'll be like, oh, I dropped everything. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, you're, you're on the dark side. Really noted. <laughs> noted. <laughs> so how do you get back on the light side? Tell me what works for you. No, then it, then it's, you know, those are th thankfully that's like a once a year, twice a year type of a thing. Um, that to that level where I'm standing in a parking lot screaming, you know, like a lunatic at nobody other than myself. Um, but then it's, it's, it is what I find is that if I just take a look at my day, my week, I'm, I've not done all the things that I know I need to do. I'm not intentional with my schedule. I'm not intentional with the tasks. I'm not organized in my task. I have let the busyness 
push away the parameters of productivity. And it doesn't serve me. It doesn't serve my employees. It doesn't serve my customers. It serves nobody. So Okay. So let's talk about this a little bit more because I, I, I feel like I've been doing this lately. And so I'm like, oh, tell me more about how this goes. Uh, because I you can't get it all done. There's so many things in business. You've been in business for 35 years. And wait, you still have more on your to-do list, right? There's, <laughs> there's always more. I've never left with it all done in one day, ever. Well, and that's, and that's, the, and I don't think, I don't think it's possible. I mean, maybe I live in a different reality, but there's, because there's always going to be new things that we can do because we're awesome, amazing people that can always do more. <laughs> so we can't course. feel bad about it not getting done, number one, right? No. No. But, th but then how do we, how do we mitigate that to leave without things being done? Because I also love having things checked off lists, right? And especially I, I just, I do so many of these interviews and I'm like, oh, I should do that. I should do that. I don't know. I can't do any of it right now. <laughs> Right? How do you deal yeah. with all of that? Please give me advice. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, I'm going to go to some of the language that I've heard over the interviews of my podcast and, of course, all the great books that we read. And the thing is, these these concepts are put out by multiple, you know, by entrepreneur after entrepreneur, because they are true. It's the big rock theory, move the big rock. Or I had one woman on my show, Marianne Cherico, and she actually said the sentence, what would the CEO do? And I went, oh, I like that. Because it's sort of like there's times where I am like knee deep and I'm like, oh, my God, there's 10 people here that could do this. And there's only two of us here that could do this thing. <laughs> yes. What am I doing with this? So I just feel like, look, I, we're we're sort of lighthearted here and doing all this stuff. But a, a well-run business is rooted in its systems. There's no question. And I I just don't think that there is any magic pill. And the reality of the magic pill is the decision to run your business in it, the parameters of its system. And when you're haywire, it's because you're haywire. You know what it is? It's like, to me, this is what I said. How many times have you met somebody that is, I'm on a diet, I'm on a diet, I'm on a diet, I'm trying to lose 20 pounds and I can't lose 20 pounds. And you're just like, Come on, sweetie, you can lose 20 pounds. Like you're not, you know, you can't lose 20 pounds and have a Snickers bar. Yeah. That's why you can't lose 20 pounds, right? <laughs> Wait, is I mean, that what? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I, oh my God, I'm not making light of anybody's yes. genuine struggle totally. with weight loss. Yes. I'm talking about the person that's really full of nonsense, that really is not actually doing any of the systems to lose weight. And so it's the same with the business. If you're scattered, I'm not saying as a 30 plus year veteran of business that I've never experienced scatter, but I know darn well what I do because I am scattered. I'm not employing what I know to be the way to do it. And so people listen to podcasts, they read books, they want a magic answer. And the answer is set up the foundation, put the processes in place and run them. That's it. Everyone's like, that's so unsexy. Darn <laughs> it. Sweet. Not easy. <laughs> Man, I wanted a pill. <laughs> So, so I keep, I keep going back to you and everybody knows because the past few interviews, I'm like, I just want robots and then the robots will be the systems <laughs> and then I can just be on my merry way. <laughs> Put me on the list for those robots. Seriously. That's my next company. Seriously. Uh, but, but it is one of those things where what's difficult about knowing that you have to do systems is feeling scattered, knowing you have to do systems and going, oh, that's even more on my plate. Oh, that's awesome. True. That's true. No, it's true. And in that case, you're exactly right, Jamie. I, I agree with you 100%. In that, in that case, the, the, the thing is to start with something. And because you know what it is, I'll use the same analogy as the weight loss. Because when you start with one something and you master it and you feel good and you see the result of it, then it's like, ooh, let me start with another something. And it's the same thing. It's like if you don't really get serious about your food intake, your exercise output for three weeks, and then you finally get real and you look in the mirror and that one first week that you do it and you know you did it and all of a sudden you lost two pounds, you're like, oh, I could do that next week. And so it's the same thing. It's it's very overwhelming if you have no systems to listen to great coaches like yourself that teach people how to put systems in. It's sort of like it's too much. So pick one thing and, and make a system for the intake of your new clients. Just one system. 
and then watch it work and you get excited about it. You're like, whoa, that was awesome. And now I want another one. Okay, let's have another one, you know? That's amazing. Well, because that feeling of being on top of something, like, oh, I, I did that. Oh, I'm like proud of myself. That creates the momentum, which makes you feel so much better. Though uh, it's funny because this happens to my clients, happens to me too, where where I'm like, I'm scattered, so I'm just going to not look at it. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I'm just going to go over here and be on Facebook or whatever. You know what I mean? And so while I know what the logical thing is, it's sometimes easier to not, but I know what works. So what what do you do to try and get yourself over that uh, hump, that motivation hump of, hey, I don't want to look at it, or versus I'm going to take on one thing and feel that feeling of, let's go get this one small thing? Well, I, I'm the sort of person that I'm, I'm, a, I'm very much a realist. And so what I will do is I will have like what I call the big girl panties conversation with myself. I'll be like, all right, you're overwhelmed right now. You have 15 things to do. There's about a minute and a half left of this day. And tomorrow is going to start like, you know, gangbusters because it's going to come with its own list and you still have today's list. And so for me, I literally go to instead of that moment of overwhelm and that moment of the pile, I go to, well, what are your options? You could put your head in the sand and you could not do this because is it not going to be there in an hour or two hours? So I go to the result. How will you feel? Whatever it is, if it's a, a task that I can get done in a half hour, an hour, or it's a task that takes a, a week, how will I feel in one hour if I've done this? How will I feel? As, 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 and I'm actually talking about times when it feels hard to push through because you're exhausted. You're really tired. You've already done 11 hour a day and you had this one last proposal that you really promised somebody would go out today. And I have sat there literally exhausted at 1030 at night and went, well, I could blow this off. And what will I feel like tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Or I could accomplish this. And what will I feel like tomorrow? And but mostly I'm going to say I'm going to be tired tomorrow either way. So I may as well be tired and accomplished. <laughs> I love that you have this talk in your head, <laughs> right? Okay, you get this, you get that, you know. And and look, I, again, I, I look, I interview a lot of business people on my show too, and I, I don't mean, I, I feel like a lot of people come on very polished. I listen to a lot of podcasts, very polished. This is how you do it. This is what you do. It's all easy, and if you do it, it'll work. And I respect that because as a podcast podcaster. I want people to come with a straight line. And as a podcast listener, I want to get on and get a straight line. Yes. But there is this whole other side of it that isn't so pretty. And thank you. Thank you. So, you know, and that doesn't mean that when we don't have the pretty moments that we're not good business people and that we're not doing the right things. It just means that it isn't all just, hey, open the rule book and do it. <laughs> Eventually, though, you have to do that. You have to open the rule book and do it. See, I so appreciate somebody that's been in business for 35 years and with their husband, by the way, that can can tell us how it is because it is a little bit too much polish. Now, I work with clients and when I work with clients, they tell me all of the crap. So I know yeah. what it really you is for it. six and seven figure <laughs> business owners and nobody wants to share that stuff and they all think they're crazy. And I'm like, no, that's, no, no, all, everybody's crazy. That's right, that's right, right. It's sort of like, you know what it's like? It's like when you watch the Oscars, the red carpet and you're watching all those women and this and that and the other thing and then you watch a show that like they've got their boobs taped and they've got their head taped up and it's like what they got you know 19,000 things it's like it isn't just the good all of it is good but all of the good isn't easy or terrific or glamorous or something. I don't know. You know yes. I mean? Yes. Thank you. Because we need to hear that, especially mm -hmm. moms, especially uh, women in business too, trying to juggle all of the things and be perfect at all of it because that's what we do, right? Um, that's the goal. <laughs> yay. Look at me. I'm perfect. Oh, I'm not? What? Uh, but, but having the permission to hear from somebody who is successful, who loves their life, really important for us to go, oh, you can still love your life and have crazy moments. Right. Great. I'm not, I'm not alone in the craziness. Okay. I know we have to start wrapping up and I know this totally went a totally different direction than we planned on. And I love we that. We exactly planned not to go this direction. We're so good. I, know, I love this. I'm like, let's go. All right. Perfect. I love how you ride the wave with me. You're totally go with the flow. Okay.
<laughs> I have to ask the same last question I always do. So it's what's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? All right. So I, I have to say that keeping in the theme of our discussion here, and instead of, you know, look, on a, on a very practical level, I would say definitely identify your core mission. I would definitely do that. So you, from a practical level, you have to identify your core mission. You have to know why you're in business and what your objective is. Then you have to establish your systems, okay? And you have to execute them. And then you have to decide to do them. So those are the three things I really think you have to do. But based on our conversation, what I would say is that if you could this week, whether you're in business one year or three years or five years, if you could, if you love your business, I'm going to make an assumption that you love your business. If you could just give yourself the gift of picturing yourself in 35 years and picturing where I sit now, I, I, it's like the childbirth. I guess it was hard all along the way, but at this point, I just remember all the joys and all the successes. And that doesn't mean I won't hang up this podcast with you and something will blow up, but you do get to a point where if you're running it well and you have healthy respect for the people that are involved with you and your clients and yourself, you get to the point where you come to gratitude for what you've created and awareness of what you've created. And if you're not sure of that, do a pretend, do an act as if, do a, a moment where you picture yourself there 30 years down the road and say, that's going to be my reward for digging right back in now when I really am tired and my kids are crying and my husband wants dinner on the table or my wife didn't make dinner for me. <laughs> but 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 take a moment to visualize that exercise and and hang on to it and work hard and get back in there. I'm going to do this tomorrow during my meditation. I usually do one year, five years. I haven't done a 30 year. You forget. Yeah. Time's going to pass yeah. either way. I so That's appreciate right. you saying that. So I'm going to change that up because a lot changes in 30 years. That's 35. Right. You've been in business as long as I have been alive. <laughs> I know. That's, and you look amazing. <laughs> Smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, whatever's working. Totally. I don't care if it's like pins or whatever. Like you said, I'm, I want to look like you. Uh, that being said, you're amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. Can you tell us where, I know you have a book coming out soon. Tell us where uh, we can get, uh, find you more online or your podcast so that way everyone can subscribe. Yeah, the podcast is a well-designed business podcast, and it is geared towards the interior design industry, which is my wheelhouse. But I always say to outside entrepreneurs, substitute the word interior design for bricklayer. We talk about business. You know, we talk about how to run a good business and how to do systems and so forth like that. So um, that is right now that podcast is living on the Window Works website. So it's www.windowworks-nj.com slash podcast. And of course, Window Works itself, you know, for window treatments, anybody that's in the New York metro area, we're happy to help you with window treatments or awnings. And then the book is called The Making of a Well-Designed Business. And it basically is... The combination of that, you know, okay, page one, how to open a business and the reminiscing and the homage to having the experience of building this terrific business with my husband and our cousin. So oh, I can't wait till it comes out. And of course, if anyone is in your area, you're the Windows authority. So everybody oh, should go <laughs> check you out. I'm sure they want to call you up anyway. Thank That's you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really, really, really appreciate it. I enjoyed it so much, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the Eventual Millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus, you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new Start Here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you. And have a fantastic day. Bye.